I would now like to introduce the moderator for today's webinar, Ann Petrick, Director of Research at Vistage. Thank you so much. Confidence with caution is the headline of the latest report from Vistage, CEO projections for 2019. And thank you for joining us for this opportunity to learn more about the insights from this report from Vistage Chief Research Officer Joe Galvin and two of our contributors, Mark Emmer from Optimize Inc. and Kathleen Quinn Vota from Talent Trust. Today, we're going to review the highlights from this report and hear more commentary around the five key takeaways, digging into how an uncertain economy may necessitate a refined approach to your business in the areas of talent management, customer engagement, business operations, financials, and leadership. As Chief Research Officer for Vistage, Joe Galvin provides small and mid-sized business leaders like yourselves with the most current, compelling, and actionable thought leadership to guide your decisions on how to optimize your business as well as enhance your leadership. As an established thought leader and analyst, Joe has published countless reports and blogs, as well as presented to business leaders around the world. You might have the opportunity to see him live at one of our upcoming Vistage Executive Summits. Welcome, Joe. I'll turn control to you to get us started. Great. Thank you, Ann, and welcome, everyone. Each year uh, in December, we survey our members, asking them a series of questions that really gets into what their thoughts are, their intentions, as they look into the year ahead. Today, what we want to do is share with you those projections from our survey that we did in December of 2018, thinking about 2019. As Ann mentioned, our theme is confidence with caution. And it's interesting because it was just a year ago when confidence was at a peak. Our CEO confidence index, which we've been keeping and tracking since 2003, 2003 reached a decade's peak. Uh, and I refer to them as these are the good old days, saying at that time that we'll look back on 2018 as the good old days. Now, just a year later, we see confidence with caution emerging among our members. We see our confidence index having plunged now four consecutive quarters since that high. Uh, when we track our confidence index against GDP, you see that the confidence expressed by our members, by our CEOs, leads GDP usually by three, six, or nine months. You'll notice this anomaly here uh, between the rising GDP and now our falling confidence. We think that's related to the impact of the tax cuts, unexpected tax cuts that have, have boosted the economy, but have now worked their way through, and we believe we're going to see that line turn down uh, as we start looking at Q1 and then on into 2019. What's interesting to note is that where we are today is where we were uh, just a couple years ago, just three or four years ago, and now we have to understand or begin to determine where is the bottom uh, because it's, uh, we cannot control the economy, we cannot control policies, but we have to understand them because the key to any slowdown is the belief that there will be an upsurge on the other side and it's knowing when that is and our ability to step on the accelerator that will allow us to, uh, to achieve first. Our members are very confident. We asked them if they plan to increase their total number of employees in the next 12 year, in the next 12 months. 65%, two thirds of our members are increasing their headcount. That means they're adding people, and this is increasing headcount upon years of head, increasing headcount. We asked them again, do you plan to increase, maintain, or de decrease your total, your firm's total fixed investments? Meaning, are you going to invest money into the business to grow? And again, we see that 43% of our CEOs are increasing investments. Another 45% are remaining the same, which means 88%, 90% of our members are maintaining or increasing their investments. These are not signs consistent with a slowdown. Yet, when we ask them, compared to a year ago, have overall economic conditions improved, remain the same, or worsened? We see a fall. We see now just 44%, a 20-point drop from just a quarter before when we surveyed in September of 2018. We asked a follow-on question. Looking forward, during the next 12 months, do you expect the economic conditions will be better, about the same, or worse? And you'll see that confidence has plunged to only 14% believe the economy will improve going forward. And this is a foundation between, behind our concept of confidence with caution. We continue to see CEOs being very confident in their business's ability to grow based on the fact they are continuing to add people, they are continuing to invest in their business, and they believe that both their revenues and profits will increase. However, there is caution, caution driven by the economy, caution driven by policies that are in effect, that make us begin to think that uh, we are, if not in already into a slowdown, about to see a slowdown. And that's our theme for, 20, uh, for 2019, is confidence with caution. Confidence in our business, but concern about the market that we're gonna get into.
In today's session, we want to explore and go deeper on this theme as we want to be able to understand and dig into what are the key decisions that our members are making? We ask them, what are the major decisions you'll be making in 2019? We want to share that with you and get some insight around it from our experts. We'll next look at the major investments. It's not just that you're investing, but where are people investing and what are the implications of that? And then we'll wrap up as we go into what are the key takeaways? What are the key issues, major topics and priorities of the small and mid-sized business CEO? To help us do this, we brought together a great panel of experts, folks that have contributed to our report. Uh, Mark Emmer, he's the president of Optimize Inc. He is a Vistage member. He is a Vistage speaker. In fact, Mark has, spoke, has presented to more than 200 Vistage groups, and he's a regular contributor to, Vistage, to the Vistage Research Center. Uh, you might have seen his very popular series, Trends in Business, that he does annually at the start of the year. Mark's a recognized thought leader in strategy and strategic planning, and his book, Momentum, How Companies Decide What to Do Next, should absolutely be on your shelves. Next, I'd like to welcome Kathleen Quinn Votal, another Vistage member, long-term Vistage member, another Vistage speaker and sponsor, and another regular contributor to the Vistage Research Center. In fact, she's got a couple pieces up there right now. Uh, Kathleen is a recognized expert on culture and talent management. Her book, Solve the People Puzzle, How High Growth Companies Attract and Retain Top, top Talent, is a key piece uh, of information we need to understand as we see people uh, increasing their headcount and wanting to better manage the talent they have. And then we'd be joined by our own Ann Petrick, Director of Research. She does so much of the work behind these reports and generating the data and making sense of it. Um, she's gonna have some great insights for us. So if that is a backdrop, Mark, let me turn to you first. What are your thoughts when you look out into the market in terms of economy and policy? And more importantly, what do you hear CEOs talk about as they think about 2019? Well, I think the economy is sending a lot of mixed signals. Um, we saw GDP grow 3.4% in Q3. We saw it drop to 2.6% in Q4. Uh, we're looking at about 2% in 2019 and sub 2% in 2020. Um, so I don't know that I would uh, use the word recession. I would probably use the word slowdown. Um, you know, unless you know, we see some kind of shock like a meltdown in China or escalation of a war between India and Pakistan or, or some outlier like that. Uh, we did see some extraordinary events in Q1 that have certainly impacted our clients, things like the government shutdown and lower tax refunds. And of course, I think there's a lot of lingering concerns about China and Brexit and the political infighting in Washington. But in regards to China and tariffs, um, we're supposedly going to see a deal within the next month which is supposed to include the elimination of, of forced tech transfer um, and, and other conditions. But I'm kind of skeptical that any guarantees that uh, offer long-term protections to U.S. companies um, can be counted on. It's, you know, it'll take Chinese companies some time to kind of uh, regulate their behavior. And if either side should kind of go off script or, or not perform, you know, any deal could kind of unravel uh, pretty quickly. Um, so, if, if we do see a deal, you know, I don't think we should be quite partying in the streets quite yet. Now, the savior of our economy at the moment is that consumers are spending. You know, for example, Target just came out with their results and they had 4.5% same store sales increases, which is very strong. Wages are higher. B2C companies are doing very well at the moment. I know a lot of our e-commerce clients are growing uh, close to 20%. So my view is we're already in the slowdown. But there's also a lot of uh, animal spirits. And what I, what I mean by that is we're overly euphoric when the economy is doing well and we're overly pessimistic when the economy is slowing. And the variance between the two might be 2 percent. Um, so we're expecting business spending to be up uh, 5 percent in Q1. So it's not really a bat in the hatches kind of scenario, more like we have to adjust our expert expectations and strategy. So. There's just a few things I'd like to point out that the members should be thinking about. First of all, if you haven't taken a price increase lately, now is the time to do it. It's going to be harder to do later in the year, and there's plenty of justification with the higher costs of labor. Uh, secondly, lock in your credit lines now. While the interest rates are, are certainly stable at the moment, we know that regional banks tend to constrict uh, credit when there's a downturn. Um, make sure you have very solid cash flow projections. A lot of companies rely on their financial statements, but the number one reason that companies fail in downturns is they run out of cash. So make sure you have 
clean cash flow projections. And finally, in terms of client retention strategies, um, I, I see a lot of companies that are investing more in tools and analytics so that they can stay in front of their clients more often and kind of deepen uh, their engagement with the clients that they already have. So those would be some of my high level thoughts. Great, thank you, Mark. That's great insights. And you know, it, it's, hard to, it's hard to visualize a recession when we're at full employment and people are continuing to hire. You know, the old Ronald Reagan comment about a recession is when his neighbor loses his job and a depression is when you lose yours. Uh, I don't see anyone losing their jobs today. So there's there are some headwinds, uh, but clearly there's still some strong tailwinds. So thank you for your comments. Kathleen, let's turn to you. Uh, you engage and talk with folks on a daily basis. Uh, help us understand your thoughts and some of the things that you're seeing out there. Thank you, Joe and Mark. I enjoyed your comments. I have had the pleasure of traveling throughout uh, the country to talk to Vistage members. I've had six trips since the beginning of this year and have touched more than 200 members. And what I'm hearing out there, Joe, is that um, people feel like we're hitting a speed bump, but we're not going to stop our momentum. Um, there is optimism. People are cautiously optimistic, as you have stated, but they are still struggling to find the right people to grow their businesses. In fact, 46% of companies cannot grow because they don't have the right people to grow their companies. We also have another phenomenon that their people are leaving. I'll talk about that a little bit later in our webinar. But what, what's fascinating is that the forecast on job growth um, is just a little weaker than we anticipated it to, according to Wall Street Journal. Um, you know, a couple economists that forecast, they have predicted that the pace of growth will slow down to 1.3% versus their very optimistic 2.0% that they thought would happen in January to March. But here's the really good news, and I am very much an optimist, that, that really we're gonna recover what's not happening in Q1 in Q2. And I couldn't agree more with um, Mark on increase your prices to your customers now because wage pressure is here to stay. So if you can increase your pricing to your customers, start passing a portion of that on to your employees so you have the best and brightest. Because what we're also hearing is that when people get to the finish line or the altar, as I like to call it, with the candidate, they're getting surprised. They're surprised that people are saying no to their job offer because there are 6.2 people looking for jobs right now, but there are 6.9 million jobs open. So we have what, we, what I call an inventory problem. There's just not enough people. And the good news that I've heard from many economists, because we watch this very carefully, uh, the good news for my business is that there's going to be some pressure on companies to find, keep, and grow great people. And they have to put strategy around it and pass that responsibility on to their customers, too, with Mark's point on a price increase. The other thing that I wanted you all to think about a little bit when it comes to an economic speed bump, as I like to call it, is, you know, just wait a few minutes, things will change. I've had my business for 15 years, and many of the Vistage members that I talk to regularly have weathered many storms. So we have a powerful community here in Vistage, and you can certainly rely on some of the, um, let's call them, uh, speed bumps, personal speed bumps that all of us have experienced and how we've survived the economic downturns prior. So we have great tools with the networks that you can start discussions in your industries to um, really help build some strategy around any kind of revenue or margin slowdown you might be experiencing because there's a wealth of knowledge in our 23,000 members that you could learn from. I'll great. pass it back to you, Joe. Great, thank you, Kathleen. Uh, you know, you make a great point about everyone's looking to hire and everyone wants to hire great people. The challenge is that great people have jobs, including the great people that work for you. So it's a double-edged sword in terms of you looking for great people and people looking at your great people as well. So it creates this tremendous pressure 
um, on, on the whole talent management arena. So thank you for that. Uh, let's turn to our own to Ann Petrick now. Ann, you do you do so much work inside the data. Share with us some of your thoughts on, on what you see here. Yeah, absolutely. I don't have the opportunity to go out and speak to people, but I certainly have a lot of qualitative data that um, helps us understand what the, the state of SMB leaders are. And Joe, you walked through some of this data about you know the economy and prospects and expansion, and those are really the elements that we're looking at in the Vistage CEO Confidence Index. And we had the opportunity, um, we just closed the Q1 survey, so a lot of the data in the report is based on what we captured in Q4, looking forward across 2019. But but as we look ahead uh, to, to this quarter, the data that we've captured in March, um, we're finding that the um, in the area of the economy, we're seeing another drop. So it's another 15 point drop from last quarter to this quarter, um, just under a third of CEOs saying the economy had recently improved. Um, but what's interesting is the 14% of CEOs expecting the economy to post additional gains, that's staying the same, all right? So, so the economy, we're definitely seeing that there is that, um, uncertainty around the economy, but when you look at the prospects for business, and this is fascinating, um, that re revenue expectations is holding. So 70%, that's identical to last year. And profitability, you know, that's really close to what we had in, in Q1, um, Q4 as well. So, so those, um, the confidence is holding and the expansion plans are following that as well. So when you look over to the um, investments and expansion, you know, we're seeing slight slowing, slight dips, but that's not really the, the concern. So, so while there is still some uncertainty around the economy, there is still the um, strength of the prospects and the expansion plans remain strong. I did want to talk a little bit, um, we talked about price increases with both Mark and Kathleen, and we, we do capture that data as well. And in Q4, uh, Mark, you'll be happy to know that 54% of our members were planning to increase prices in the next 12 months. And in Q1, that held pretty strong with 51% planning price increases. So there's definitely, with the rising cost of everything, and I like the idea of passing the um, some of that onto employees, but that is definitely something that we're seeing um, our members look at uh, in the future as part of the their plans for for 2019 and into 2020. Well, great, thank you, Ann. And, and the data supports our belief this confidence with caution. And you can see in the data here, even with the data that's fresh just from what we closed it on Monday, um, confidence remains strong. People continue to feel they're going to grow their business, and the concern about the economy remains. Uh, as, as both Mark and Kathleen said, time will tell. Uh, but in the interim, this is the playing field upon which we need to go forward as leaders and manage our business. So let's go and now move on to our next section. Let's focus on the key decisions, and then we'll talk about investments. So we asked this question. Uh, before we do that, I want to set this up because what we use to, uh, to be able to uh, understand and align uh, what these issues and decisions are is something we call the Vistage Decision Model. The decision model is a model not for how to make decisions, but a model of the decisions you have to make. And it starts with you as a leader. How do you show up every day as a leader? Uh, what are the attributes, behaviors, and competencies of a leader? We then talk about leadership or the process of how you lead, the techniques and the processes, the disciplines of leadership. We then look at the areas of business optimization. When we combine that with our concept of optimized decision-making of instincts, judgment, and perspective, and connect it back to the research we have, we now understand these categories of decisions of customers, talent, financials, and operations that the leader and how they lead now comes into play. With this as a backdrop, uh, let's take a look at these major decisions. We ask this question, what are the major decisions you'll have to make regarding your business in 2019? Pause and think for a minute. What are the major decisions you're facing? What's top of mind for you? What are those big decisions that will determine the fate and the fortune of your company? What do you think the top 10 answers were? Well, here you go. It turns out that uh, consistent with last year, we're hiring, recruitment, and sourcing remains at the top of the list. And then we asked for three answers. So we have over 3,700 3, responses here to pull this together. When we connect the dots on all of these responses and run it through the text analytics, text analytics engine, we can see how this now connects to our decision model with talent being the dominant issue, the number one decision that we see CEOs are facing. So Kathleen, this is a natural entree to you. You are an absolute expert in the area of talent and talent management. Give us your thoughts on this and, and your concepts around why talent is so critical right now. 
Oh, thanks, Jill. I'm not surprised that it continues to be one of the major decisions that drive most of our members because we have a couple different things uh, affecting it right now. One, we've got an inventory problem, 6.2 million people looking for jobs and 6.9 million jobs open. That's the first problem, inventory. The second problem is that we don't have the people internally with the leadership skills to run our businesses. We have some succession planning and some leadership gaps that are uh, very wide and deep in most of our companies. Third, we have an issue that 76% of the people that currently work for you right now are either open to or actively engaged in looking for another position. So that causes what I call the perfect storm from a talent perspective. Not only do you as a business leader member need to be thinking about who you're gonna hire for your open jobs, but you need to start thinking about who's the next person who's going to leave my organization and how am I gonna replace that talent? Our recommendations is to start focusing on retention just as much as you're focusing on recruitment. A tactic that you could use to really understand who's in and who's out is stay interviews, S-T-A-Y interviews. Start talking to your people and having the bold discussions about are you in or you out? Are you in or are you out? And if you're in, why are you in? And if you're out, why are you out? It requires us to be quite brave as business leaders and owners to really look inside and start building cultures by design versus default. Because if we don't, our people have choice. Not only do candidates have choice, but the people working for us have choice. So I was just in Baton Rouge with a great uh, couple members, and part of their challenge up and down the org chart is their location, their geography. People are leaving Louisiana more than they're coming into Louisiana. So they really have to start understanding their message to the candidate. So they become attractive to the audience that they want to work for them. So later in the program, I'll talk to you about recruitment as a sales process and give some key tools to the members on this phone, on this phone call and webinar. But it's so vital that we look at not only our employees, but the candidates we're trying to attract. And I'll turn it back to you, Joe. Thanks, Kathleen. I mean, it's clear last year, this year, and I'm, I'm confident well into the future, uh, the talent wars will be raging and those that are best prepared both to uh, protect and defend the employees they have as well as project their culture will be those that will attract the best employees. So thank you for those comments. Um, let's now look at investments. You know, making decisions is hard. I mean, in fact, we like to say that CEOs are in the business of making decisions. Reaching for the wallet and signing the check well, that's a little bit harder because now there's a gut check about it. So what are those major investments? We ask that question. What are the top three areas of your business you'll invest in during 2019? So stop and think for a minute. Where are you making uh, in increased fixed investments? Where are you continuing to invest? And now what do you think those top answers are? Survey says technology. Again, second year in a row that technology is at the top of the list. Um, we take this data and now we connect it to our decision model and you see a massive shift over into operations and you'll notice facilities, growth, expansion, equipment. Um, one of those tailwinds that continue to push our economy forward is low interest rates. Uh, we continue to see historically low interest rates. Granted, they're up a little bit, but they're still low, which means that's power to grow. Mark, give us your insights on these investments. How do you see this playing out based on, on what you see and what you've experienced? Well, clearly technology is at the top. And, and what we've seen from our clients is they're shifting into different types of technology investments. So, you know, most of them have done a great job over the last five or 10 years in investing in technology, but they've been inward facing technologies that have allowed them to do things faster, cheaper, and better. And what I see in the future is there'll be a need to be more focused on client facing technology. So those things that directly improve the customer experience and, and improve uh, customer retention. And I also think that it's informative that in the survey, um, the, the number two decision was uh, about market development. 
And the number one technology that members are implementing is CRM. And I, I think we're in a whole new world as it relates to customer relationship management. It, it used to be there was one 900 pound gorilla that was perceived as expensive and hard to implement and a bunch of second tier solutions that weren't very popular with the membership. So now we have a whole litany of choices. Um, there are a number of CRM suites on the market that are easy to configure, they're inexpensive, and they have the marketing automation kind of bundled in. So um, I will just point out to the members on the line that if you've had bad experiences with CRM before, as many have, I would encourage you to revisit them and in particular pay attention to the marketing automation features that allow you to build channel or segment specific campaigns so that you can deliver specific messaging to audiences at a specific time with pinpoint precision. Um, and you know, also these suites now, they're bundling in a lot of other software so that you know, they don't have to be standalone solutions anymore. So you can bundle in uh, functionality that's similar to Slack, like collaboration software, project management, marketing analytics, uh, all of those things. Uh, so CRM is a completely different animal than it was just three or four years ago. Um, in marketing, we're seeing the adopt adoption of a lot of artificial intelligence. Um, so for example, today, all e-commerce companies, um, they're written automatically to A, B test product, placement, pricing, promotion, um, all of that stuff. Um, also, I think, uh, if we pivot into a slower economy, companies are going to have to have service lines set up to service multiple price points and service tiers, kind of like the good, better, best model that is proliferating everywhere. Um, and we're seeing that both kind of in B2B and B2C. Um, also, business intelligence is a hot technology. You know, you have products like uh, Power BI that that truly are the realization of big data. So that's the ability to uh, extract data from multiple data sources and combine it in one place so you can provide more useful um, reporting uh, back to your customers. Um, we see certainly in operations uh, use of augmented reality. A lot of companies are using that for internal uh, training and other ways to engage uh, their employees uh, and their customers. Um, and so I think the theme is, is that, you know, if a downturn is coming, uh, we certainly expect that companies will be looking to replace labor with automation. Um, and that's going to be true in operations, engineering, design, sales, marketing, take your pick. So those are my thoughts. Yeah, Mark, there's no question that technology is a change agent of our generation. Um, and that the pace of change, as rapid as it seems, is only going to accelerate. And it's those organizations who can do more than just write the check, but can actually uh, implement and then have their team engage with that technology. Uh, will not just see the productivity benefits, but it'll drive into performance and more importantly, how they connect to their customers. So thanks for those great comments. So that gives us a look at key decisions and major investments. What we wanted to do is to spend a significant amount of time here talking about the key takeaways. Um, as you read the report and you, re you go through it, we get to the end, we talk about our takeaways, but we really wanted to add some color to it. So again, tied to the issues, topics, and priorities from our SMB CEOs, Let's look at our first projection. Our first projection is around talent and talent management. As Kathleen said, and I'm sure she'll elaborate, employee development is a key to retention, engagement, and hiring. Before you can attract someone to your business, you have to ensure that the people you have in your business are engaged. And we do that by developing and engaging them. Uh, we like to think that uh, employee engagement as a metric has risen to the equivalent level of performance of importance as net promoter score. Uh, when we ask about priorities, not surprisingly, the CEO priorities that came out were retention and employee development. That's where the focus is going to be. Um, we, we shared this data point before about people increasing their headcount, but Kathleen, uh, chime in on this. This employee development, key to retention, this talent management, share with us your thoughts as an expert in this field. Oh, I'm happy to. And um, Mark, great job on major investment. I did do the math, by the way. There was a 1,072 points that were about people. So I think some of the technology and investments there are going to be about human capital as well. And that leads right into these key takeaways. Um, there's wonderful technology out there to help you with human capital and ha help you get up on top of this. So retention is key, and I've already talked about that, but we believe at Talent Trust that recruitment is truly a sales process. 
It is not an administrative task. So some of the things you have to focus on, and I, I'm going to be as specific as possible so you can start working on at least one thing differently when you go back to your offices on Monday or this afternoon, is you have to start with culture. And I know culture is way overused, but when I talk about culture, I'm really talking about who are you and why should people care? It's really your employment brand. You have to start there and start messaging as to who you are out there so people can find you and your current employees can keep choosing you. And then the second part that's really important is sourcing. We tend to spend a lot of time, energy, effort, and money around sourcing our prospects, our clients, but we don't put the same rigor around sourcing our candidates who we need to serve our clients and drive our revenue. So when was the last time you actively sourced a candidate to come to your organization? One of our clients in Minnesota was astounded that it took us 14 touches to actually get somebody engaged in a conversation with them. So when I say recruitment is a sales and marketing process, it truly has become pulling people into the discussion versus them opting into the discussion. The next stage that you have to get into is using technology, as Mark commented on, in human capital as much as you do in other sectors of your business to consistently message, it, message to this audience that you want to grow your business, serve your clients, and interact with each other and your vendors. It is Im widely important that you measure so you can inspect what you expect and not leave to chance that people are actually just going to show up at your door. It's not field of dreams. You can't just build it and they will come. It truly is pulling them into the funnel and having technology to keep the conversation alive and real and stimulating for the candidate population that you want to come represent you and your employment brand. Then the next stage that we bring our clients through is as screening and assessments. Are these people, do they have the DNA to do what you need them to do? And so there's great tools out there to help assess that DNA and whether they're a fit for your culture and how they can actually impact your organization. The, the fifth step is um, interviewing and actually behavioral-based interviewing. And I gotta tell you, everybody on the call, this is where most people fall apart. They've never been trained on how to conduct a behavioral-based interview. So they get they walk into an interview, they've been um, they've prepared maybe five minutes to make on average a fifty thousand dollar decision. I'm sure you wouldn't want your salespeople walking into a sales call underprepared. Why are our managers, our hiring managers, walking into interviews? underprepared for that very vital conversation. And last, but certainly not least, know how to close the deal. In sales, it's really simple. You've got to know what the pain of your customer is in order to close the deal. Same strategy and mindset around how do you close the deal with a great candidate? So know what they need before you make the offer. And these are all illustrated on our website as well. But I, I thought those would be really good, key, meaty takeaways regarding talent management for this audience. Joe, back to you. Great, thanks. Uh, Mark, did you want to jump in on culture quickly? Yeah, you know, one trend I've noticed just even in the last year or two that's becoming more and more common is I think a lot of customers are paying attention to the culture of their vendors because they know that when a company has a really strong culture, they have stronger retention and it's those people who are serving them. So I, I actually think we can never talk about culture enough because it's not only important from an internal standpoint, but also in terms of winning and retaining our, our customers. Um, so I think it can be a real differentiator. And one thing I, I notice a lot looking at a lot of member websites as I tour the country is there's a lot of them that, you know, you go to their website and all they really have on their career page is a list of job openings. So I think the employer branding part is really, really important. And there's a lot of opportunity there to have things like video testimonials of your current employees who further attest to how great a culture you have. And 
you know, that's not only valuable for your employees, it's valuable for your customers as well. Ann, go ahead and jump in. Yeah, thanks. Uh, you know, Mark, that's fascinating because I've heard another Vistage speaker say that brand and culture are two sides of the same coin, and that's just stuck with me, you know, thinking about how connected they are. Um, but as a data junkie, I wanted to get back to what Kathleen said about the um, assessments and using those for hiring. And actually, those are really great, um, you know, once someone is on board, when you have that data from a pre-hire assessment, you understand some of their strengths and weaknesses and habits and characteristics, whatever assessment you might choose to use. That's going to be that data can be invaluable when you think about employee development and you know where someone's um, weak spots are and that you can really focus some of the soft skill development or even hard skills on some of those areas that that might not have come up as strong in those assessments. Great, thanks, Kathleen. Before we move on, what's a, what's a what's a slowdown strategy? As we as we look and think about a slowdown, what should we be thinking about from a talent standpoint? So my first piece of advice there is from a slowdown strategy, keep those people who are with you. I mean, really focus on retention first. Have those stay interviews and figure out why people are there. Make sure you're giving those good people who work for you what they need. And the second most important key takeaway is start building a pipeline. You don't leave your customer revenue to chance. Stop leaving your candidates to chance and start building a predictable pipeline so you can consistently bring in good people when you need them and be ready for when the slowdown starts, gets off the table and we start rocking and rolling again. Great, thank you. Let's, let's move on then and talk about customer engagement. Uh, existing customers are the foundation of every business. It is always the right answer to have the customer at the core of all that you do. Um, and as we see a declining business cycle, those customers become more important than ever. That's why we see our priorities have shifted. Customer service and sales. A year ago, it was marketing and sales. Now customer service has risen to the forefront. Why? Because everyone in your organization who touches a customer, not just your salespeople, but it could be billing people and finance, your customer service and support, whoever it is, everyone that touches the customer has to be aligned with what, what value means to the customer and how your organization is providing that and connecting to that. Uh, the most important thing you can do is always to focus on your customers because you can grow revenues with them, but it's also the success of your customers that radiates into uh, other customers that are out there and other prospects. So when we see organizations thinking about they're going to increase their revenues, that means they're going to increase their ability to sell both within their existing customer base and their new customer base. And the answer with customer engagement is always the customer at the core is always the right answer. If we now think about a slowdown strategy when it comes to customers, uh, it's really your, your customer engagement resources that are going to be your canary in the mine shaft. They're going to be the first ones to tell you, hey, things are starting to slow. You'll start to see things like, longer sales cycles. Uh, they'll start to trickle on. You'll see more no decisions or more not nows. Um, you'll see co your competitors coming in and discounting maybe more aggressively than they have in the past. Those are some of the metrics you want to keep your eyes on. You want to think about how you're going to begin to adapt your messages. What are the messages that your salespeople, your customer service people are sharing? Um, are they shifting from here's the cost benefit, here's ROI, here's the absolute return versus here's the appeal or here's the benefit of growth? Being able to shift those messages and tune those as customers become more protective and more defensive, it, it can be a key part. And then most importantly, you have to communicate with your salespeople. You know, quotas and territory assignments that were created in a more prosperous uh, world of abundance they may not play so well as a deceleration occurs and, and customers begin to keep money uh, closer to them. Uh, many organizations will cut training in a slowdown. That's the worst thing you can do because when, 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 when business is short, when customers are being more concerned, that's when we need to really double down on training. Things like objection handling, understanding what those objections are, empowering your sales resources with the right answers. Um, and then again, the answer always is focus on your customers. If you focus on your customers and understand that they're going through challenges as well, they will reward you when things get better. And oh, by the way, if your competitors are not doing that, that suggests then that their customers are vulnerable to you. It puts you in a position of strength and gives you the ability to go on the offense once things turn and go after those customers that maybe your competitors didn't do as good a job of as you did with yours. So let's step forward to our next, our next key projection. It has to do with operations. Technology-powered productivity 
drives operational efficiency. This concept of digital transformation, it's, it's no surprise, Mark, that productivity and technology are the priorities when it comes to operations. Uh, we asked this question about, and you had mentioned the importance of CRM. We found 78% of our members will be investing in business applications and technology. Mark, give us some insights on, on this operations perspective of uh, productivity and technology. Yeah, well, I've already commented quite a bit on a number of things that relate to operations, but um, one thing I haven't spent much time on is I, I think what we're going to see is um, the multi-tiered pricing model become more and more prevalent. And what companies are going to do is they're going to be using bots and similar technologies to service kind of that bottom third of, of the customer base. And then they will provide uh, more service uh, to, the, uh, to the upper tiers. Um, and so, like I mentioned earlier, I think we're just going to see uh, much more automation um, deployed, e even in the small and mid-market companies. I think one thing that's really concerning from a competitive um, advantage standpoint is large companies are investing about triple as a percentage of revenue in AI than smaller companies are. So um, we're going to need to keep our, our foot on the gas pen, pedal in terms of finding those uh, efficiencies to make us more productive. Well, you know, there's no question that technology really powers productivity. I think of my father who worked at State Farm Insurance. And, you know, 40 years ago, he had a room of 50 people using uh, ledgers and hand crank calculators. Today, one person's doing that with a PC. So the power of technology to drive that productivity is clear. And there's more to it than just technology. It has to do with human behaviors and other attributes. Uh, but Mark, help us uh, from a productivity standpoint, what's a slowdown strategy you might suggest? Um, well, I have some, I'd say I have some uh, general observations that, that aren't just related to productivity, but um, one is, you know, in inventory is evil during a downturn. So we, we really need to kind of pull back on inventory and also kind of tied to that is making sure we're keeping our, our uh, debt service um, in check because uh, that's another uh, kind of killer in a downturn. And a couple other general things that you've kind of mentioned already, I think staying in front of customers is, uh, is really important and, and also uh, keeping our foot on the gas on marketing. That's where uh, people, you mentioned training is one thing that companies pull back on in a downturn. The other thing they cut right away is is marketing. So it, it's good to kind of look at a trend line and what your spending has been on things like SGNA and marketing, uh, and making sure that you're kind of maintaining um, a reasonable level of investment in things like that. Great, thank you. Uh, let's step forward and look at our next projection that has to do with financial management. Slowing economy will force deeper scrutiny of cash, capital, and investments. Uh, it has to do with our ability to manage data. So it's no surprise that, and Mark, you've mentioned this a couple of times, it's, it's financial management and this cash capital, and you added the aspect of inventory. Um, we see the impact of profitability. Uh, we see, Ann, you mentioned prices before. Mm -hmm. Ann, help us with this. Help us understand how KPIs um, are so important in this slowing economy. Yeah, well, you know, we've talked about the triangulation of revenue expectations, profit expectations, and pricing, right? Prices, you know, raising prices is going to preserve some of that profitability, although I like the idea of passing those on to um, employees. And we're seeing that that's pretty strong. Um, what's interesting, when we looked at last year, 52%, um, this time last year, 52% planned price increases, this year, 51%. But if you think of that concept as a compound interest, so, you know, that those are ongoing price increases. So if we've already gone through one wave, now there's another wave coming through to help preserve that profitability. But I think really the key point around um, KPIs is thinking about what are the really important things. Uh, we did some research into understanding what are the top KPIs that are being measured by, by our members and small and mid-sized businesses. And they're, you know, they're pretty traditional, profitability measures, revenue measures, EBITDA. But I think the more important ones are the ones that are really specific to your business and what drives you and what makes you competitive. I had the opportunity to speak to a member about their business, and that was one of his key takeaways is that they figured out that on-time delivery and first-time performance were the factors that were most important to their customers, and that was their competitive advantage over everything. So they measure those metrics um, on a daily basis. So Mark, when you talk about what technology and what that enables us to do, 
they have screens everywhere real time showing what those metrics are and how they change so they're very transparent they're using technology not just to track um, those real-time results but also to share those and socialize those with employees and everybody has that shared vision and everybody knows how important that is so I think that that you know identifying those KPIs identifying the ones that are really leading indicators of, of what's going on with your business um, is really important other than you know the standard KPIs that everyone measures just to for the general health of the business. And connect us. Go ahead, if, Mark. If I could, if I could add to that, um, I, I think not only is it important that you have the right KPIs, such as predictive indicators, but it's also how you use them, right? So um, you might want to amp up the frequency and see your KPIs more often. Make sure that they're in public view, so you're using them as a vehicle to teach the business to your mid management and your frontline employees. Um, and you know, create the energy in your business that your your team is kind of invested. So KPIs are a really uh, important way to do that. And I'll, if I could jump in, Joe, just for a quick second, KPIs are woefully underused in the human capital world, and there's some great tools out there to help you measure your engagement, measure your culture, understand what your employees are talking about. There's great tools like Amplify and Tiny Pulse and many other technology tools that you can use, even the Q12 from Gallup, um, to make sure that you have, keep the pulse on your company and take the emotion out of human capital and manage it with data. Great. Thank you, Kathleen. And you have a slowdown strategy for us? You know, I think I think that our experts covered that, but really, you know, leveraging those KPIs, what are the leading indicators? Uh, engagement as a key in leading indicator of employee retention, uh, if that's important. But you know, what what is the one thing that's going to help you understand when it's time to do something different? So if you can identify those, track those, socialize those, and even think about how you connect, um, how you reward your employees around those KPIs, taking it one step further, uh, that would be the guidance. Excellent. Great. Well, let's go to our last projection, and that has to do with leadership. Um, it's the and we talked about culture, but it's the CEO's ability to instill and communicate a strong culture that matters in all economies. And we see culture. We've talked about. We see culture rising more and more to the top. In fact, the priorities were culture and communication. And your culture is what happens when you're not there. Your culture is what people talk about when they're not at the office, when they're at a, at a dinner with friends or at a barbecue or whatever it is. Your culture is your company, and that's why it's so important. Um, we asked Bob Moore, who's a contributor. Bob Moore is a longtime former member, longtime master chair out of Memphis, and he made some really insightful concept, comments about leadership, that, that going into a downturn or a slowdown, this is a massive challenge, that your employees, your employees read and hear all the things that we do, and their concern is about the business, but their concern is about them. They have to be able to look to you as a leader and know that you that, that they have confidence and trust that you understand the situation, that you are aware of what's going on and you are prepared to guide the business and guide their incomes and what that means to them and their families and their livelihoods through, through the downturn. In absence of that communication, in the absence of that void, it will get filled with rumor, innuendo, and, and dare I say, fake news. Uh, consequently, uh, again, it connects back to the people, but people are going to stay with a company they trust, and they're going to trust the company based upon a leader's ability to uh, communicate the brutal facts of where we are, the strategy and tactics we're going to take going forward, and, and deliver that belief that we will ride this out and be better and stronger positioned going forward after the fact. You know, I'd like to turn to, to both Mark and Kathleen. Mark, I'll start with you. You've been a president of your business for a long time. You've been a leader for a long time. What are your comments from a leadership perspective on this? Well, I would ask everybody to think about the last 10 years and what we've been through. So, you know, during the last downturn, which, of course, was much more dramatic, there was a lot of fear. And, you know, there was kind of a gi giant sucking sound that followed coming out of uh, that uh, Great Recession. Um, and now, of course, the economy has recovered and we've done very well. Um, but in, in the interim, we're all hiring younger workers and um, they are asking for much more transparency. So I would suggest moving forward, I would implore everyone on the line to lead with vision. Um, and that is to be very clear with your team on where you're headed, um, what your business results are, uh, why they should be confident in your company, and um, I would just suggest that they will be much more confident with you if you kind of lay it out 
um, on the line with them. So um, I would just encourage everyone to lead with vision. Thank you, Mark. Kathleen, 15 years CEO of your business. What's your strategy here? Well, culture and communication is definitely my happy place and part of what I do with our clients. But from my perspective, I agree with Mark. It's about transparency. It's about honesty. It's about giving them the good news and the bad news. And we, I share everything in my company very, very openly. Everybody knows the revenue, the gross margin, and the profitability. So that informs our business decisions as a group. And internal communications is becoming almost more important or at least as important as external communications. Um, looking at things like your E-Net Promoter Score, what do you, how, how many promoters do you have in your organization? And harnessing, harnessing that power and that communication and that message internally with people who might be detractors. And, and first and foremost, knowing what the culture is that you've built. When I talk to members, many of them are confused about culture. But culture became really sexy in 2015, and people really don't understand culture. Culture is the experience, the uniqueness of your company. It's your attitudes, your traditions, your beliefs, how you treat each other. So start having those discussions internally about who we are, what we stand for, build that culture by design, and start having the good, bad, and ugly conversations every single month. So you're team can keep choosing you during times that might not be so um, easy to navigate. Thank you, Kathleen and Mark. Excellent. I really appreciate your contributions today. Uh, thank you for being participants and contributors to our report into Vistage Research. And, and that wraps up our, our, our uh, webinar today. We wanted to go through and, and highlight some of the things that came out of the report, but more importantly, bring some real color, depth, and dimension to it. And again, thank you, Mark. Thank you, Kathleen and Ann. Thank you for your comments. Uh, we appreciate folks spending an hour with us uh, to learn and listen a little bit more, and we look forward to sharing more Vistage research with you in the future. All right, thank you so much, Joe. And so we're gonna get to some of the questions that were pre-submitted and some that have come in during the course of the webinar. And you know we've talked a lot about you know this is a, a you know, more of a slowdown and less of a recession depression. And Joe, you're out there at our summits where um, ITR and the Bolio brothers are speaking. Um, can you tell us you know what what is their most current thinking based on the last time you heard them speak about uh, what's going on in the economy? Yeah, you know I don't want to speak for the Bolios. ITR and their reputation and their data speaks for themselves. Their accuracy is 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 absolutely incredible, and they continue to believe uh, that there will see a slowdown that the slowdown in fact has initiated and will continue through this year into next year. Um, it's been pushed off a little bit, as I mentioned earlier, based on the, the, the tax reform change that went through uh, that created a boost of about six to nine months. Um, but that's now worked its way through the system. And uh, as we get through the rest of the year, um, again, I would advise you to go to the ITR website, subscribe to their newsletter, uh, but they're consistent and they have been consistent about the slowing that will occur through this year and the next year. We'll get through that. Uh, we get into 2021, things will be good up and to the right, and they continue to maintain. There's a there's a sharp drop coming 2029, 2030. Uh, Mark, I'm going to direct this one to you. You know, which industries, when you look about the the softening of the uncertainty of the economy, do you, do you feel like there's any industries that are more significantly impacted, especially with with things like tariffs? Yeah. Um, well, if we look at the the last recession, uh, again, not necessarily uh, framing this downturn as a recession, but those companies that are serving kind of the bottom third, the socioeconomic scale, um, so rely on consumption sectors like furniture, for example, they're going to be impacted more than the others. The uh, business consumables like uh, concrete or building materials or printers, uh, they will be more affected. Those that uh, serve discretionary businesses like the airlines and the travel industry will certainly see an impact. Um, and I, I just say, generally speaking, larger companies, they have more capital and, and more cash to sustain it through a recession. So um, anytime we see some kind of downturn, we, again, we just need to preserve our, our cash. 
Great, thank you. Um, Kathleen, I'm gonna switch to you. Um, you talked a lot about strategic sourcing and we had a question about um, an emphasis on hiring transitioning military members. And can that be a competitive resource in the talent wars? Absolutely, thanks Ann. Um, actually, it's great timing. I wrote an article that's on our blog, Talent Trust, one T in the middle and just click on resources. And it talks about hiring a vet and it gives you all the benefits and the how to's. Some of the benefits are they, you know, vets and are really, they have great characteristics. Uh, you certainly have to measure those characteristics with an assessment for your company, your culture. Um, they really are loyal as the day is long. They're lifelong learners. There's many benefits. And also there's a fiscal advantage in this particular period of time where there's some tax advantages both on the state and federal level. So I encourage you to go download that particular uh, blog on our website and start investigating how that might help you fill the top of your funnel. Great, thank you. Um, Kathleen, I've got another question for you. So um, you talked about behavioral interviewing and yeah. we have a question specifically about using that in manufacturing environment. So is, is, um, is that more difficult to implement than in an office environment or are there any suggestions around that? Um, it is it should be implemented in any industry uh, across the pos uh, positions in the org chart. So we work with a variety of cornucopia, if you will, of industries all over the country. We work with manufacturing, construction, et cetera. And behavioral-based interviewing doesn't have to be fancy. Um, what we do is we help our clients to design scorecards with those questions. And more inf importantly, Anne and the member who asked this question, you have to know what the answer is. You have to know what good looks like to the questions you're asking. So. Um, if you want to do it yourself, which I'm a big fan of, there's um, Google some behavioral based interview questions, build a scorecard so you then know what the answers need to be and you can train your hiring managers and just start with one or two in each department for each position. You can't eat the whole elephant in one sitting. Just try one thing. Okay, great. And along the lines with interviews, then you also mentioned a stay interview. Do you have a suggested suggested agenda for that? Yeah, my suggested agenda is it's not formal, mm -hmm. <laughs> that it's very informal, um, because many of us <clears throat> tend to over engineer some of this stuff. Um, but you could have uh, step one would be sitting down with your hiring managers because they're the people that you're employees tend to continue to choose or uh, continue to quit um, and find out if they know how to have an informal conversation about someone's engagement with the firm. <clears throat> so it's really informal, only two or three questions, <clears throat> excuse me, why people continue to choose the company, the culture, um, and why they would leave. So those are a couple good places to start and I invite that member to call me if they need more detail. Very good. Okay, we're running very close to time, but Mark, I'm going to send one more to you. And uh, with the, your background and your insights that you've shared in your blog series, this is something a little more politically oriented. But what impact do you foresee the fall 2018 election outcome and the pending 2020 presidential election? What What do you think some of those impacts might be? Are you sure Kathleen doesn't want to answer this one? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, Mark, that's for you, honey. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I, I would say the uh, range of potential outcomes is so broad, it's, it's hard to say. I, you know, I think obviously that the tax cut has had a big impact in the economy. Um, we, we may be coming towards the tail of, of the kind of short-term impact. Um, and to say, I mean, I, I, there's going to be a lot of infighting next year. That's going to be an ugly election, and there's all kinds of ramifications that I, I don't think we can cover, like in the next 30 seconds. I, um, so, not to change the subject, but I just like to add um, on to Kathleen's last comment. I do think there are things in terms of labor that companies can do to flex. So, one thing is, is if you make sure a higher percentage of total comp is an incentive uh, uh, than maybe in the past than uh, than base salaries you can flex with the economy. And also if you are 
um, labor is more virtual, then you can flex more uh, with the economy. So those are a couple of labor oriented things that I think uh, companies should be thinking about as well. Great, thank you. And and we do have a partnership with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, and we're looking forward to um, tapping into some of their insights in our next annual piece that will come out in uh, June or July when we look at the decision factors for the latter part of the year. You know, really looking at policy without politics. So so for those who are interested in something that you know more uh, oriented towards the the policy landscape, we'll be talking about that in the future. And that's all part of our goal to be um, the SMB CEO's most trusted resource for this kind of research data and pe perspective on the issues, topics, and decisions of both business optimization and leadership enhancement. So thanks everyone today for their time. And I wanna make sure that you know about some of the upcoming sessions that we are holding for Fridays with Vistage. Uh, their next one is how you can calculate business value and why it matters, which was, will be held on March 29th with Dave Heyman of the Generational Group. And on April 5th, Kathleen, you return to the Fridays with Vistage platform um, and share with us the new recruiting paradigm, how to get smarter, faster, and more strategic. So we had a lot of questions about um, hiring and, and talent, and we know that that's a top priority. So really looking forward to that session, Kathleen. My pleasure. So thank you. Yeah, thanks again for everyone who's here and have a great weekend. We will follow up with some of the questions we were not able to answer. Thank you. Thanks, Sam.